What's going on, Salt Strong Nation? Me and Justin Ritchie are back for another tea time. This is going to be a very fun and educational one. It's going to be on nearshore fishing. We're going to be covering everything you guys need to know, a little 101 class on nearshore fishing, both out of a kayak and out of a boat. We're going to be going over species that you could target, rigs, setups, everything there is to know about nearshore fishing. So Justin, thank you again for joining me today. It's uh, going to be a fun one, I believe, man. Yeah, there's there. this is a topic that we've been looking forward to, to chatting about pretty much since it started warming up in uh, April and May and we were getting all of our gear together, um, then we were in the heat of it. This is the best time of the year to go for any of your nearshore adventures. Um, a lot of migratory fish start pushing in a little bit shallower here in the summer months. And sometimes there's areas you can fish within a mile or two of the beach that has monster kingfish, the really big kingfish move in super shallow this time of the year. You've got migratory tarpon that'll make their way all, they're up in the panhandle right now, making their way over to uh, Alabama and even parts of Texas, which is nuts. Um, and they're probably up in the Carolinas on the East Coast as well. You've got even cobia will move their way through. I've seen a couple of reports of guys getting 30 and 40 pound cobia out of Tampa. And it's summer right now, but these fish still move into random and different haunts in the summertime. And they'll find pieces of structure to hang out on. Uh, triple tail is a good option. And right now we've got red snapper season wide open here in the Gulf. So this, there's a lot to, to talk about. I'm probably going to shave the tip of the iceberg today, but I think this is going to be a, a lot of good information for everybody. Absolutely. And I mean, just in terms of somebody that's not done it a whole lot, I'm just starting to get into the game and I thought there was a lot more to it. And it always just seemed like something that was unattainable uh, for your average inshore angler to go out and do, but there's a lot of concepts that transfer over. And I find it's really not that hard to make that jump from inshore fishing to offshore or near shore fishing. It's a little bit easier than I believed to be so. And I've had a great time doing it. Like you said, this is just a peak time for somebody to get into it and get on a lot of fish. And speaking of fish, let's talk really quickly before we dive into some of our setups and things like that. What kind of target species are we gonna be after uh, this time of year? What's most prevalent? What's easiest for folks to go after? And you've got a little bit more experience than me in terms of what's you know running seasonally, near shore and offshore. What do you find are the best species to target this time of year when you're looking to kind of implement some of these near shore offshore tactics? I really think that the gateway drug to get bigger into this, and we didn't even really talk about it on a pre-con, but is Spanish mackerel. We get a lot of Spanish mackerel that show up at the jetties. You've, you've gone fishing for them a bunch. They're right off the beaches. And the bigger brother of Spanish mackerel is kingfish. And I think kingfish are found just about everywhere. In the Gulf, far up in the Atlantic, even up into Virginia, kingfish are accessible. And as we make our way late spring into early summer, into the heat of summer, and pretty much the beginning of fall, you get big waves of kingfish that are following temperature breaks uh, at, you know, different parts of the year, different regions, you know, where, you, where you're at on uh, latitude. And, um, and these kingfish follow bait schools in. So I say kingfish is the number one thing that I think of when I think of near shore fishing. Um, anybody that's ever caught a Spanish mackerel before, whether it's on a spoon or a tiny little greeny or white, or like a little pilchard or any kind of white bait, uh, a gotcha plug, even a slam shady on a jig head, if you know how to target Spanish mackerel, it's basically the same type of approach, but with a little bit heavier gear. That's all it is. Um, and you, you can do it on a spinning setup, just beefing up your gear a little bit more to accommodate for a you know, potentially 30, 40 pound kingfish, which would be nuts. Some, some people may have never caught a fish that big before, but it's very doable. And I think that's why we're so excited to share this with you guys is it is really accessible. I do this kind of stuff out of a kayak. I'll go down to South Florida in 300 feet of water and catch 20 pound tuna and 80 pound sailfish. And you know, if, if it's doable out of the kayak, it's most certainly doable out of a 20, 21 foot boat or a very small boat if it's flat calm. And we're gonna get a lot of weather days like that over the next couple of months. So kingfish I would say would be the main target. Um, and then some supplemental species that would still roll into that near shore category are tarpon. We get a lot of the big schools of tarpon head up from the Keys and they make their yearly migratory route out west up through the Gulf, the Panhandle and out along the, uh, the Eastern Western Highway there in the Gulf. And then they make their way up along the East Coast as well. They're starting to show up in Brevard County right now. I think I've, we've talked to Courtney up in Jacksonville. There's still good sized migratory tarpon making their way up to Jacksonville. 
So they could even be in the Carolinas by now. Um, and tarpon are monsters. Leave me a little bit heavier leader, different approach, circle hooks. Um, and aside from that, you can get a bonus cobia. You can definitely get a bonus triple tail after we get these crazy windy storms to come through and blow all the debris in, floating piles of grass, a bucket. I mean, why? You got your first triple tail recently. We found a little guy under a bucket. Yeah. Um, you never know what you're going to find when you're out there. Uh, and uh, and then I think some other nearshore species, depending on where you're at, um, anything that's very heavily structure oriented, like a like a reef line or a, a wreck or just a, a patchy piece of rubble, is going to hold snapper and grouper and and any type of variety of those bend thick bottom dwellers. Um, that's going to be a relief system. It's going to have places for them to hide. It's going to have bait. So snapper and grouper, if it's within that couple mile range. And they're all going to be really oriented to pieces of structure on the bottom. So I think those are all the species in a list to really look for. And for the most part, you can target all those species with one setup, whether it's a spinning or a conventional setup, and we'll go into that. But I think having one of each, if you want to cover all the bases, is probably the best way to go uh, if you have the means to do so. Yeah, no, I, there's a lot of different species. As you mentioned, there's a lot of different fish you can go after. There's different approaches to each. Um, but just from what I've experienced, it seems like the easiest one, like you said, to get into is king mackerel. So I, I want to kind of first start diving into some equipment that someone that's looking to get into this is going to want to go pick up. And I was actually really surprised by, you know, you think offshore, you think of these big, meaty, crazy rods. When I started looking at some of the gear that I was going to be using for kingfish setups, it looked a lot like my inshore stuff, just slightly heavier. So being that you are a resident tackle expert here at Salt Strong, I'm going to let you kind of break down what your average, you know, entry level setup would be for kingfish. Okay, so we're always trying to keep, you know, budget in mind, value and performance at, at the center of what we're looking for in terms of tackle. Um, if you're going to get into fishing for kingfish, it, the rod will also work for tarpon and cobia and other things that are, you know, surface oriented fish and are known for pulling a lot of line and covering out in the open ocean where you don't have a lot of pieces of structure to worry about getting broken off on. The biggest thing that I look for on a rod for those pelagic fish is something with a slightly light tip. These lighter tipped rods, whether it's a spinning rod or a conventional rod, is really gonna do a number of things for you. Number one, a lighter tipped rod, something that's got a little bit of give, Luke will call it a wet noodle, this is where the wet noodle comes into play in a good way. Um, those lighter tipped rods, let's see if I can grab my conventional setup. What they're gonna do is they're not gonna impede the action of your bait as it's moving through the water. If you're using a live bait and you just put a live bait out in 25 feet of water right off the beach, if you had a really stiff bottom fishing rod, spinning rod, conventional rod, doesn't matter, and you've got a stiff rod, then when that bait's moving through the water, that rod is resistance to the bait. So on my conventional rod, my tip's actually pretty light. I mean, it bends down uh, maybe a, a quarter of the way down. That light tip, not only does it allow my bait fish to swim naturally and not have a lot of resistance, but when a kingfish goes and moves 30 plus miles an hour and attacks your bait, that soft rod is going to be shock absorption. In addition, to having a monofilament top shot. So I always like to run monofilament on top of my setups, whether I'm using a spinning setup or a, uh, or a conventional setup. I have braid underneath simply for line capacity. Um, in case I do get a 40 pound king and he dumps 200 yards of line, I've got that line capacity of braid underneath, but I like having about 80 yards or so of monofilament top shot. Just, I do an FG knot, I connect my braid to the mono and that's really part of the shock absorption aspect. So I've got the light tipped rod, I've got the monofilament. So when a kingfish comes and hammers that bait, the rod's gonna absorb the shock, the monofilament is gonna have a little bit of stretch, it's gonna absorb the shock, and I'm just gonna afford myself the chance of staying connected to that fish a little bit better. So those are, those are the two main things that I wanna have on a setup. In terms of economical value, there's a lot of brands out there, I think, between $100 and $120 is probably the ballpark, just like for an inshore setup for a rod. Ugly Stick makes a Ugly Stick Custom, I think, that's got a light tip. Um, generally, what you're going to look for in a conventional setup, um, some rods may even be called 
kingfish rods. And, and then we'll, you'll know indefinitely, this rod's really designed for that approach, for using a live bait and just bumping around with the boat or the kayak or you know slow trolling a dead bait, like you'll talk about here in a little bit, Wyatt. Um, but on a spinning setup or conventional, seven foot, perfect length for just about everything. And most of those uh, line ratings are gonna be in that 15 to 30 pound range. They may be called a heavy powered rod, even though it doesn't feel as heavy as you might expect it to. Um, but for that application, they would be called a heavy pound, a heavy rod. 15 to 30 pounds, the range, you might find some rods that are 12 to 25, some that are 15 to 40 pound. Mine is really a custom and it's a 17 to 30 pound, kind of a weird range. Um, but that's kind of the baseline of what you're looking for. And I think that $100 price point is a good starting point on a rod. Um, reels are a whole different approach. Uh, we'll go to spinning. So I grabbed two different examples. With a spinning setup, uh, this is an eight foot rod. This is my, my tarpon rod. And I just, this is when I don't wanna have my feelings hurt and I wanna have all the backbone in the world. Um, but for a size for a reel, I think a 6,000 to 8,000 size spinning reel is, is kind of the best range for using live baits, dead baits on the surface. Even if you're bottom fishing, you can easily bottom fish with a six or 8,000 size reel. Uh, 30 to 40 pound braid, perfectly fine. You should get about 300 yards of either braid on a 6,000 to 8,000 size reel. And for a rod, this is an eight foot. I like having distance when I'm casting to tarpon that are rolling or daisy chaining or schooled up. I, I like that distance when a fish has pulled a lot of line out on the surface. You'll have more control over a fish with a longer rod, but it isn't as effective for bottom fishing. So if you wanted a rod to do both, surface fishing for kingfish and tarpon and bottom fishing, go with a seven foot. The seven foot's not gonna be at that much of a disadvantage when fighting a tarpon and he's got a hundred plus yards out. Um, it's not as much of a disadvantage. As long as you keep your tip high and keep that line out of the water when he's far out, you'll be perfectly fine. And the seven foot's just gonna be better for bottom fishing because your fulcrum point's gonna be better. You're not gonna have as much rod out. You're gonna have more power on that, on that butt section of the rod uh, when you're fighting a fish vertically. Yeah, it seems like I, I would say the biggest difference, you know, most of our inshore setups, we, we see a lot of spinning gear. Uh, there are some bait casting reels out there, but they're not conventional reels in the respect that we're looking at in some of those adits that we're going to talk about here in a minute. It seems like the only time we're going to use larger spinning reels is when we're wanting to get, like you said, a little bit distance if we're casting at tarpon, things like that. We're not typically trolling for tarpon. Um, but it seems like most of our trolling setups are going to be geared towards conventional reels. So, I, and just kind of seeing all the different reels that I use for kingfish setups, it was a lot of stuff I was inexperienced with. So I wanted to kind of get a breakdown from you on some suggestions for maybe conventional reels, seeing that most folks that are going to get into this, this might be their first kind of setup they would use for trolling. Uh, so I'm sure there's a lot of questions there in terms of, you know, what's a good budget or best bang for buck in terms of, of a conventional setup uh, when we're trolling? Because we're not really doing a whole lot of casting here. I think that it, there's different price ranges. I kind of did a quick search right now just to see what was accessible in today's day and age. When I started doing it, a Shimano Torium or a Dial Assaultist or a Daiwa BG, they had the Daiwa BG in a conventional for a, for a couple years. Um, those were both $150 conventional reels and like a size 20 or a size 30 that were perfect for, for that type of application, for light trolling, for bump trolling, which we'll talk about later with live baits. Um, a size 20 to 30 conventional in that $150 price range would get it done for a number of years. But doing a quick search, someone might have an older Penn Senator uh, someone might have a Pen Warfare, which I think those are about $90 right now. And uh, Daiwa has one. I think it's probably 120 to 140 bucks called the Daiwa Seagate. Um, that, that's relatively new. They've had the Seagate for years, but they've revamped it over the years. Um, so a Warfare for $90 under $100 by Pen. Uh, again, I think a size 20 to 30 is kind of that best range. You really only need to go to that 30 if you're gonna be dropping you know, down on bottom fishing in much deeper water, 200 plus, plus feet. Um, and then you know, a Shimano Torium 20 or 30, and a, 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 they make die with saltists in that $200 range, but that's, you're starting to get up pretty high. Uh, and then you mentioned an Avid. I think there's an Avid MX, MJX, MHX. There's a lot of different models of Avid is another brand. Seagler is another brand. But a lot of those reels are $250 and more 
And that's really for when you get really involved in the sport and you want something that's going to last a long time and be consistent, kind of like with your inshore approach, the difference between a, you know, a, a Daiwa Legalis for $70, $80 and a Daiwa Ballistic for $250, you are kind of getting what you pay for in that regard. But to get it out there and get it done, um, you can, if you have it, and I feel like a lot of people have it as a, as kind of a hand-me-down through the family generations, a Penn Senator, it can work. The gear ratio is going to be slower and therefore your inches per turn might be slower. So when you're targeting a kingfish and they run out and run towards you, you're really going to have to wind down on that fish to make sure that you don't get slack in your line. So I think for targeting kingfish, you aren't necessarily trying to winch the fish in like you would bottom fishing for snapper and grouper where you need a little bit lower gear ratio and you need that torque for, for, you know, going for tarpon or, or kingfish where you're going to use the rod to kind of fight the fish and the reels just picking up line. I think in that regard, it's about higher gear ratio and a more inches per turn back on, back on that reel. Um, so for all the models I mentioned before, uh, I think, a, I think a dial with Seagate in that 120 to 140 price range is, is a good call. Um, I don't know the gear ratio of the pen warfare, but if there's a faster gear ratio model for under a hundred dollars, I think that's a pretty good option to look at. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think uh, one thing I don't know if we covered was uh, the sizes because I, I, I know most folks are thinking of those those pen senators that they saw on Jaws, those big 16 knots. Uh, and I had one myself for shark fishing not too long ago, but you really don't, in terms of what I've seen, you don't need really big reels for kings. You just need uh, enough line capacity to, if they go on a big run. But a lot of the reels I was using were some of those uh, Abu Garcia ambassadors. These are This is stuff that my granddad was using for bass. Uh, you know, it's, it's surprising how light you can go on tackle for these fish. And it does make the fight a little bit easier, especially with higher gear ratios. When those, those Kings, like you said, start running at you, it's very important to keep that slack out of that line because most times we're using treble hooks and we want to make sure that they don't have the ability to, uh, to throw that. So, uh, in terms of sizes, if you could just give one overall, I guess, through each of those brands, you know, what a pen, maybe nine ought, uh, and some of the other brands you mentioned, what size would you look for? It's tough. With the Senator series, there's like, you know, 112s, 113s, 114s, 114Hs, WHs. There's different sizes with the Senator specifically. So that's kind of why I said a size 20 or 30. Shimano and Daiwa, for the most part, have the same numbering sizes on their conventional reels. Uh, an accurate, you know, this is an accurate 500. This is a Valiant 500. Um, that's probably equivalent to maybe a size 30 Shimano and dial, uh, might maybe even a 40. So the numbering, um, just like in the spinning world, you know, I think uh, Quantum has like size 20s, 25s, 30s and 40s and their inshore sizes. Every company does number um, their sizing, their reels a little bit different. But if you're to go with what's most accessible, um, probably a, a Shimano or, or a Daiwa, the 20 or 30 size, a 20 is probably fine for just about everything you're gonna do. If there's a little bit of a price jump in the 30, it's because it's a little bit bigger gear and it's gonna have more line capacity in case you also want to bottom fish. But I think a 20 is more than enough. These conventional reels hold a lot of line. A spinning setup, a 6,000 or 8,000 size spinning reel will hold 300 plus yards of 30 pound braid. This guy right here holds like 500 yards of 30, maybe even more if I put it on there tight on a line machine. Um, and that's, that's more than enough. 300 yards of 30 pound braid gets it done. That's what I use in 300 feet of water for tuna out of the kayak with a spinning setup. I've yet to be spooled. Knock, knock on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, one thing I wanted to point out, I had this up for a reason. I put it down. So on a conventional setup, guys, why I was talking about the Abu Garcia ambassador, the C3 and C4 5,500 and 6,500 size ambassadors that have been around for a long, long time. Um, they're great surf reels. They're great pier reels. They're great kingfish reels. They do, some of them, not all of them, have uh, level winds on them where the line is, the level wind is bringing the line back onto the spool evenly. You have that on a spinning setup with your line roller where the line comes off the line roller, winds back on the spinning reel. On a conventional setup, when possible, I actually prefer not to have a, a level wine. It's convenient. It will probably work most of the time for kingfish. But the last thing that I want to happen to anybody, myself or any of you guys out there, is to hook a monster 
And that level wine, while it's convenient with lining the line back on level on your reel, it is an extra part that can break on the spinning reel if not properly maintained, sprayed down, oiled if necessary. But if you hook a big fish and that line is pulling off faster than that level line can keep up with, you run the risk of the line doubling over and, and just creating a mess for yourself. So it is more effort to manually kind of guide the line back onto the spool when you're reeling and, and fighting the fish. But after one or two fish, it becomes like second nature. So it's something that kind of like working a topwater lure. If you've never done it before, it might be weird to get that cadence to work that zigzag lure. But once you get it, it's second nature and, and you'll just do it every single time, even when you're panicked. Trust me. <laughs> That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about all the time decreasing the chances of foul ups with gear by taking off swivels, not putting on those little tactical clips, just you doing straight loop knots, things like that. I didn't even think about the level one messing up. And I, that's just something you wouldn't know if you didn't do a lot of near shore, offshore fishing. So I'm glad you, you brought that point up. But I think we've now pretty much covered everything there is to know about gear and having you know a basic setup to go out and, and target some of these fish. So I think the next thing to cover before we kind of dive into spot selection and species specific tactics, would probably be baits and rigs. You know, we're thinking about how we're getting all of our gear together. The next step is obviously putting together some rigs to go out and target these fish. So what would you say are, you know, some primary rigs and baits that you're gonna be using when you're targeting all these near shore, offshore species? So the next part of the equation uh, is knowing what bait is available to you in your region. Hopefully we'll, we'll be doing a podcast on all types of baits this summer, um, you know, soon. But when you're going to go out for kingfish, tarpon, cobia, anything that's going to be migrating and moving around, know what bait fish is available in your region. So Menhaden, for example, very, very popular throughout the Carolinas and from about Brevard County on the central east coast of Florida north. There are Menhaden around the Panhandle. I think there's Menhaden there over in Texas and Alabama in the summertime as well. Um, but Menhaden's a great oily bait fish and there's schools of them that migrate. So the kingfish will follow them. Threadfin herring off the beach, big greenies. They have a lot of different names. The ones with the big thread along their back. Um, excellent bait fish for kingfish and tarpon. Uh, I would also look for blue runners. Blue runners are really hardy. And just having four, five, or six in the bait well, they will last all day. You probably not even in a bait bucket. With a five gallon bucket and aerator, you can keep a couple really nice blue runners or hardtails, uh, the vernacular changes based on where you are. That's probably one of the go-to baits for professional kingfish guys, part of the SKA, um, the Kingfish Association. A big blue runner is is primo live bait for, uh, for, for big kingfish. Yeah, um, you don't see too many of those in bait shops. I, the easiest way I found to catch blue runner, if you've got any kind of hard structure, oil rigs, you know, big, big, hard standing structure, I find dropping a gotcha plug and just jigging it a lot of times you can pick off those, some of those blue runners from some of that hard structure. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, for anybody that wants to go out and catch their own bait, I said, man, it's kind of bright white lights if I get that up close. This is a, just a sabiki setup. These are a little bit bigger um, quills. These are a little bit bigger sabikis. And if you're going to go for blue runners, or this is the sabiki setup that I use for goggle eyes, I can't believe I'm sharing this because this was a secret for a while. <laughs> uh, Hayabusa D119E sabikis are the goggle eye sabikis. That's a whole different endeavor to catch that bait at night. Not easy, but they're great for blue runners as well. Um, that way they're just, the line is a little bit heavier and blue runners are pretty, pretty aggressive when they hit your sabiki setup. So if you try to go out there with a smaller, lighter line sabiki, um, you can get them, but if you get a big blue runner, there's a chance that they could potentially break you off. Um, that, I mean, the line rating on that is seven pounds. Uh, so it, compared to like 15 on that other one. So, you know, that'll, that'll be a little more hardy. Um, but aside from blue runners, I mentioned goggle eyes and the Southeast part of Florida guys will pay a hundred dollars for a dozen goggle eyes. That sounds insane, but you got to catch them at night. And you got to get them on certain sabikis, and it, it's such a hassle. But they're called uh, Big Eye Scad. And the Scad variety, some of them, there's another version called Speedos along the east coast of Florida. Highly, highly prized bait fish. Very difficult to catch, but uh, excellent baits. Um, but sardines. Sardines are another one, whether it's a scaled sardine like a pilchard 
or a Spanish sardine that I call like the hot dog version where they're a little bit longer and skinnier. Sardines are excellent, both for surface baits for kingfish and for mutton snapper, gag grouper, all kinds of bottom fish as well. Even if they're frozen, sardines are a great bait to have. Um, and I think, man, that, that about covers the majority of it. When you get into fall, kind of the oddball bait is a big mullet. A big mullet would work, guys. Like a good eight to 10 inch, you know, black or silver mullet out there on the surface, because they're gonna hang out and be goofy on the surface. Uh, in the early fall months and late summer, that's that's like a big kingfish bait. So that's something to keep in mind. If that's all that you have access to, you can cast net them inside the bays and go out and use them for sure. Um, but for the most part, your pelagic, uh, your migratory bait fish, your pogies or menhaden, your threadfin and schools of sardines or even blue runners, those are going to be the main bait fish to look for when you're out there. Um, and to kind of segue into the next part, we talked about bait fish, at least live bait fish to use, which would, I would think would be the preferred way for most trolling setups, um, is what kind of hook, what kind of rig are you using uh, to go out and get these kingfish or tarpon or what have you? If you know that you're just going to be going for kingfish and we start figuring out what to look for, we're going to talk about that next. Highly, highly recommend tying yourself a stinger rig. So why and I talked about this a little bit, a stinger rig, for those of you that might not know, is a setup where you have a hook up front and a hook in the back. Traditionally, your nose hook could be a treble hook or a J hook, doesn't particularly matter. Um, and then your back hook, for the most part, would be a treble hook. Um, we found that a number four to a number two size treble hook is about the right size for most bait fish applications. And then for a nose hook, you can just double that and use a treble hook for the nose as well. This hook is going to go through the nose of your bait, and this is going to go through the back of your bait, right around the back dorsal fin area. Um, and really the length at which you tie uh, these wire stinger rigs is going to depend on what bait fish you're going to go out and use for the day. So if you just have little tiny pilchards, four to five inches, you might only need just the nose hook. If you're going to have a big blue runner, like six inches plus, you're going to need a little bit of gap between your nose hook and your back tail hook on this, uh, this treble. And really, nine times out of ten, that's what's going to get your kingfish, is that back hook right there. You're going to go up, take the propulsion off the bait fish, and they're going to get snagged or caught in the side of the face with that treble. That's what happens most of the time out there. Yeah, that lead hook's more just to kind of keep that bait centered and make sure that it runs properly and straight. Uh, and I'm sure most people are wondering, okay, why do you have a stinger hook? If, if the main hook is in the back, why do we not just, you know, set the hook there? Um, I'm sure most people have not been out and experienced how most of those kings come up and hit these baits, but they're hitting it 30, 40 miles an hour and they're taking swipes. It's not like, you know, we've seen some underwater footage of trout where they're tracking a bait, they come up behind it and engulf it. These kings see it from a good while out. They've got great vision. They come up and they just, they cut a swipe. Um, and a lot of times what we'll see is if you don't have that stinger set up and you've just got that lead hook, you're going to be reeling in a bait that's half as half of whatever you put out because they literally hit it so fast it tears that bait in two. And if you start using some kind of larger baits that we were talking about, maybe some larger mullet, um, another bait we didn't mention that I've been using a lot here in Texas that works really, really well is a ribbon fish. And, or, or there's ballyhoo as well. They function in a similar length and uh, kind of action in the water. But these baits are pretty long. So let me grab my stinger rig here. The ones that we created to make sure that uh, we, you know, because we used the just two stingers and we were reeling in baits that, you know, the tail was still hooked and the head was still hooked, but there's a big piece of the midsection that's gone because that king came up and that's what it swiped. So the reason that uh, we, we create stingers, and I actually have a triple stinger here, uh, is to cover the entire length of the bait so that kingfish can't come up and take a swipe at those baits and not hit one of these hooks. Um, and they're all connected with haywire twists and we have videos on how to tie this. In fact, we're gonna have a video on how to tie one of these kingfish rigs up. It should be up actually now, thinking about when this podcast is gonna be out. Um, but this, I think, in terms of when, whenever I've gone offshore to troll, it seems like there's always a stinger rig out on the back of the boat. And it's really simple to tie, just haywire twists, a couple of three quarter ounce weights here to keep the, the bait down. You can even flatline it as well. Um, but this is, uh, I would say probably the, one of the biggest staple trolling rigs out there. Would you agree, Justin? Yeah. Well, the ribbon, the ribbon fish rig, 
uh, that is that is the jam. Like that's been done for many many years. It can be hard depending on where you are to catch ribbon fish yourself. There's areas you can catch them, but for the most part, buying fresh frozen uh, or fresh dead if you can find it, ribbon fish from a bait shop, rigging it properly with that weighted rig up in the up in the part uh, the front part of the bait, um, having two or three or even four hooks stretched that way. It gives off so much undulation. It looks like a big snake in the water. And those ribbon fish are really shiny. They got they got like this iridescent hue down the side. And it's just like a shiny flag moving through the water. Kingfish go nuts for it. I don't know why. It's just it's just like a like a blinker going off. And the kingfish love ribbon fish. That's one of their main, you know, uh, food sources. It's just not as readily accessible for us to catch live. So, yeah. Um, but it's a good thing to have if you're like, oh, I don't want to go catch bait. Let me go buy some ribbon fish in the local bait shop. And Wyatt will have some tips and tricks on how to rig that properly if you guys want to go out and troll ribbon fish for bait. That's a good idea. Yeah, and one thing I'd like for you to touch on, because you, you play with a lot more live bait than I do, how would you rig a live bait differently than a dead bait on one of these stinger rigs? Because I know that's a really important, it's a mistake I've seen a lot of people make, and you've touched on it a little bit in our conversation. So why don't you cover that real quickly? Let, let's say this is a tiny thread thing, okay? I'm just going to take a Slam Shady Bomber. With my nose hook, let's see if I can spread this out a little bit. So you got your trace of wire, usually to a swivel, or if you get savvy, you'll learn how to do a line to line, but that's a pain in the butt most of the time. Uh, with your nose hook, there's a lot of different ways to hook live bait, but I think the most productive way when rigging a stinger is taking your J hook and going through the nose sideways. I'm gonna see if I can get that hooked and then I'll show you guys. So I went through the bait sideways. I didn't go up underneath the chin. I didn't go up through both lips. I went sideways through that nostril cavity, uh, a little hard to see, but sideways to that nostril cavity so that when I'm pulling the bait along, the hook is kind of angled up like this and the bait fish is being pulled in this manner. Then with your back stinger treble hook, this is really long, but I go up through the top part of the back and I try to make sure that when I hook the stinger that I don't just like skin it because then that treble hook's gonna pop out. It's gonna be bouncing all over the place with your live bait. I get it in the back all the way in. Sometimes I'll even hook it to where the treble hook is facing forward like so, so that when a kingfish does come by and try to take off the propulsion of the bait, they're gonna be grabbing that back part of the hook and that's gonna dislodge and that's how you're gonna get your kingfish. So I do try to angle my treble hook facing forward. Let's see if I can get a <laughs> focus on that. This looks like a mess right now. But the point is when I hook my, my live bait, I try to go sideways through that nasal cavity so that the hook is gonna be angled upwards when that bait is being pulled along. And then this back treble hook I put into the back, but I try to put it in in a manner where the treble hook, the points of the hook are going to face towards the front of the rig. So, man, it's a little tough with uh, with video, but we'll make a, a whole other segment about that, about tying stinger rigs and hooking live baits. But I hope that's uh, that's kind of a good introduction to it. No, I think that's that's perfect. I could, I mean, I was learning a lot. I've never thought never thought about angling the hooks because that's really good. Those kingfish, you know, they're not coming from up top usually when you're trolling these baits. They're only, you know, two, three, four feet under the water. If you're flatlining, they're right on the surface. So having those hooks angled, that's a really good tip to make sure that you're, you know, getting those good sets on those kings because most times, you know, those, those kings, they come up, they swipe, and they're either there or they're not. It's not a whole lot of how you decide you're going to fight that fish. It's the initial strike that comes from them. And I guess setting your hooks at an angle can definitely turn the odds a little bit more in your favor. So that's a good little nugget of knowledge there, Justin. Thank you for sharing that, sir. Uh, do you have any other rigs that you use for trolling or is it mainly just stingers? It's just stingers. But what I wanted to show you guys is that if you're, if you don't know what you're going to go for, and it could be, you could, there could be tarpon out there. There could be cobia. There could be triple tail too. Just, just free swimming. Um, go with a circle hook guys, especially if you think you're going to also bottom fish later on in the day. Um, these stinger rigs are really exclusively for kingfish. They will, you'll still hook a tarpon every now and again. You'll still hook a cobia that's hungry and comes by and takes your bait. But the wire and these multiple hook rigs are really designed for the kingfish to try to come up and slap your bait and move really, really fast. But 
when you can, if you don't think the kingfish are going to be in your area and that's not what you intend on targeting, go with monofilament or fluorocarbon leader. What we talked about, about 50 to 80 pound leader really is the range of, of nylon leader that you should be using for other migratory near shore species. And, uh, and a big circle hook between five aught and seven aught, I think is the, is the best size for all these same live bait fish that we're talking about. Blue runners, thread fins, mullet, uh, pogies and, and goggle eyes. A five aught to a seven aught circle hook, just depending on the size of the bait that you have is the way to go. And uh, if you do plan on bottom fishing later on in the day, there's a lot of times where you're even required to use circle hooks, whether you intend on harvesting or not, depending on the reef structure and where you're fishing, um, circle hooks are required. And it's just the safest method for you, for the fish, for catch and release, uh, and for hookup ratio. Because when you do get a circle hook in a fish, that puppy's not backing out easy. It's, it's in there. It's going to catch that side of the mouth much easier. Uh, it's going to help with getting the fish off the hook easier as well. So when I go for tarpon, and if I decide to go for, for cobia, or if I'm bottom fishing for a gag grouper, I'm going to go with a big circle hook. So the only time I'm going to run a stinger is if I'm saying I am going for kingfish and I just don't want to be cut off three or four different times. Um, so those are really the two different approaches to, uh, to your live bait setup. Yeah, I think I think that covers it really well. But I, a good way, I guess, you could differentiate with what you're doing, and this I, this does a great segue into what we're going to talk about next. Is that uh, you know how do you pick where you're going to fish for each of these species? You know, when we talk about kings, you and I both have some slightly different approaches uh, on you know either targeting structure or targeting uh, different depth highways, things like that. We're going to dive into those in a minute, but certain fish are going to be what you know we see as traditional pelagic swimming out in open water um not holding to you know specific structure like we see with inshore game fish you know we'll find redfish hanging around oyster bars things like that a lot of these pelagics like kings sailfish mahi they're not on a specific form of hard structure like that um and it it can be difficult coming from an inshore background to know where to look for these fish uh, it's just different forms of structure and justin has a way of doing it that we're going to use a, an inshore example on uh, i like to troll around rigs for some of these uh you know larger pelagics but in terms of you know most of the inshore species we talked about the tarpon the cobia um the sailfish kings where do you start looking when you're going after each of those species? I guess we can do a quick kind of species profile for where we're going to want to look as far as spot selection goes. Well, I always want to keep going back to kingfish because I think that kingfish is going to be the most readily available near shore species to just about everybody out there. Um, whether you're fishing one to two miles off the beach or you make the run, you know, eight to 10 out to a, a reef line that's in 100 feet of water, depending on where you're at. Kingfish, I think, is the most accessible nearshore species. The things that I'm looking for, why we, we talked about this beforehand, the biggest thing you want to look for, just like with inshore fishing, is structure. If it's a wide ocean out there, and for the most part, it's a desert, depending on where you're fishing, these fish are going to be in certain areas for a very specific reason. A lot of times, the main reason is structure and bait fish. And I'm not, necessarily, not really sure what the chicken before the egg thought is there, but structure and bait fish is the key. So when you can find a piece of rubble or a, a sunken boat or an artificial reef structure, artificial reef structure should be relatively easy to find on a couple different apps. Um, and they're all public numbers. So you guys can head out to these spots a mile or two out off the beach in a kayak or a boat on a calm day and bump around a live bait and kingfish are going to be around that, that wreck or that reef. So why pull up real quick, um, kind of some examples of where people can find these near shore reefs and wrecks so they can go out there and, and at least get their feet wet and, and, uh, and get a couple of nice fish. Yeah. Can you see my screen right now? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So on salt strong, if you guys want to find, you know, artificial reefs or oil platforms or things to kind of start your search, because when we talk about where you're going to find inshore game fish species, typically the first thing we do is go to Google Maps and, and look for, you know, grass flats. We start looking for those oyster bars. Most satellite imagery companies don't go map out images from the middle of the ocean. So it's going to be impossible, you know, even in 20, 30 feet of water where you, if you were in a plane, you might be able to see a sunken boat from above, but nobody's out mapping those areas. So the only kind of resource that we have 
is the state artificial reef programs and every single state has them. And on Salt Strong, we actually did the work for you guys. We went out and we found every single link to each state's artificial reef program. So for example, recently I did, I did an insider report where I went and targeted kingfish on oil platforms, uh, just trolling circles around them. And all I had to do to find oil platforms was go to Salt Strong, go to, you know, type GPS into our search bar and you'll get all of the states um, different reef program links. Just go to the bottom and you would click on click here to access the Texas Artificial Reefs interactive mapping application. If you're in Florida, we've got one for Florida. We've got one for any state pretty much in the US uh, that's on the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic. Uh, and all you got to do is use that state site and there's a tutorial for each one because not all of them are going to look like this, but you can see there's different options here on the left for what you want to select. You know, I'm here in Port Aransas. So I can click on one of these stars and see, oh, we've got an artificial reef here at Boatman's and it gives me the latitude, longitude, it tells me the water depth, everything I could possibly need to know about these reefs. You know, we've got all kinds of different types of structure here I have to choose from. And we can see, you know, a lot of different information here, but that's the first step uh, I would say in terms of how you're gonna start looking for spots basically this is how you're doing your pre-planning to find these fish justin has another really interesting approach and i can go ahead and pull up another uh, another resource we have on salt strong um which would be justin if you want to start talking about you know your depth highways because that was an interesting thing for me because you know inshore fishing a lot of times we talk about targeting depth changes and the, the edges of flats you know i see this a lot with trout specifically they're not holding, you know, in two, three feet of water. They're using the actual change of depth to target fish. You know, those bait fish that are traveling along a certain kind of narrow stretch of depth, and they'll use that depth to target, you know, those pinfish, those mullet, things like that. But you pulled a very interesting kind of tidbit for me on depth highways for near shore fishing. So dive into that, and I'll go ahead and pull up a way that some folks might be able to use our, uh, our smart fishing tides to, to plan around this route. Sure, sure. Uh, real quick, make me host and I will go over and uh, and pull it up. I can't seem to pull it up real quick. Oh, yeah, I will do that for you. Let me... There you go, Justin. You should have those privileges now. Thanks for hanging with us, guys. Yeah, man, no problem. So, to Wyatt's point, um, living in Orlando, I'm an hour and a half from either coast. Uh, when I make the trek over to the east coast of Florida, if I'm fishing down in Southeast Florida, it, it gets deep really, really quick. So there's a reef line in Southeast Florida down in Fort Lauderdale, Miami in 60 to 70 feet of water. So within a, just a stone's throw away from land, I can hit a reef line and there's all kinds of bait and structure. But if I wanna go over to Brevard County, just straight over to Cape Canaveral area, it's a desert wasteland out there and it's hard to find little pieces of structure within two, three miles of land. So the kingfish still move into all these areas, but you ask, what are they following? Well, they're following the bait schools for sure. They're following these Menhaden schools that run real tight to the beach. And sometimes they'll be right up on the beach in you know nine feet of water, 10 feet of water. And sometimes they'll start sloping out where you see it goes 16 to 23, to 27, to 31, you kind of see these contours start slowly sloping out. Again, the first thing I'm looking for is bait schools, diving birds, signs of life, even small schools of jumping Spanish mackerel, even turtles. Maybe I'm superstitious, but I've always gotten good bites when I find a congregation of sea turtles around because I feel like they're there for a reason as well. Um, but what I've found to be the most successful thing for me is if I can't find these bait schools, if the bait school is up tight to the beach, okay? And you catch your menhaden or mullet or what have you up shallow and you fish around those bait schools and you're not getting hit for a couple hours, start zigzagging and moving out to these contours. And a lot of times these migratory fish, they're heading north, right? These fish are following thermoclines and they're following temperatures as they increase. And so they're, they're heading north, north, north through the summer months. And then once we get to fall, they're gonna head south, south, south. So I try to zigzag through these depth contours out east and then back in west, heading north the entire time until I get a bite. And then when I get that bite, I pay close attention to what depth I'm in. So I could be heading out from 14 to 21 to 28 to bam, 
I get hit on this contour line. I go, okay, these fish are around 30 feet of water. They're not in 12. They could be out in 40, but I got my bite in 30. So I'm going to stay and I'm going to tighten in my narrow approach as I zigzag and head north and bump troll or slowly bump around that live bait, staying within that range by about five feet. Um, now, again, some areas like in South Florida, that depth can go from 40 feet to 150 feet right here. It, it can drop really, really quick. But staying within about five feet of that depth where you got hit is going to be the, the zone you want to stay in. So that's why I call it a depth highway. Um, as you zoom out, you'll see a lot of these depths will start slowly, gradually dropping. It goes from 9 to 10 feet out to 25, 30, and then it stays in that 40-foot depth for a long time. See, it even says sand, nothing, no pieces of structure. But these fish, when they come in on the beach, and that's why we're saying near shore is so exciting, because there's a lot of dead zone out here. The fish are going to move in to get on the bait, even if they're not right up tight on the bait. They could be in around these contours where it starts sloping out, and you just zigzag between these contours until you find out where that primo depth is. For some reason, these fish just get laser focused on particular depths. And that's that's kind of the, the work on your part you guys will have to do as you zigzag to find these fish. That's uh, I, I like the idea of tightening in the pattern. So you're doing those zigzags. It's almost like we talk about with power fishing. You know, we're burning shorelines, burning shorelines, and we start, you know, seeing some bait. We have a general idea. Uh, and then once you get that hit, you know, you take notice of what the trend was, what depth was I in, maybe what that water temperature was, and then you can tighten in your pattern to start, you know, finding out where those fish are going to be in that trend. So I really like the idea of doing that. Uh, I want to kind of expand a little bit more on what I was doing because I, I just touched on how to find those spots, those oil rigs, things like that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up that artificial reef program here again. Uh, and basically what I'm doing is, you know, we're thinking about that form of structure, be it that oil platform or something that is, you know, hard structure, a wreck, artificial reef. And let me go ahead and share my screen here. And of course, these little stars don't want to pop up while I've, I've zoomed in on the map. So we're going to pretend I, I've zoomed in here just on a, a random little piece of a uh, piece of structure that I found. So there's something out here. It looks like it, it could be an artificial reef because there was a star over it. So let's say it's an artificial reef and we're over this piece of structure right here and you're trolling. You've got your, you know, ribbon fish. And what you're going to do is start making circles around this reef uh, in this fashion. And like Justin said, there's going to be a specific depth that these fish are going to hold at. And when I was out, you know, I took uh, a couple days in a row and started going after kings they were at a very consistent distance from whatever piece of structure that uh that we were targeting be it you know an oil platform if it was a standing pipe uh they weren't you know uh 500 yards away but they also weren't you know 50 yards away it seemed like they were hanging in the mid-range and that was the trend for that day for the temperatures that we were fishing you know all of that they weren't right up on the structure. They weren't super far away. And all of our catches came within that circle. So that's the circle we just started to run. We took notice of that specific form of structure um, and how far those fish were hanging away from it. So just running circles. And another thing that we were doing to kind of play with the depths uh, of where our baits were is we would, as we were making the circle, you know, we'd get to our 12 o'clock position up here we'd idle. And Justin touched on this really quickly with a bump troll. We'd idle for, you know, 45 seconds to two minutes uh, and let those baits drop all the way down to the bottom. And then we'd slowly pick it up again, let those baits rise up. And most times those fish were hitting on the rise. So we knew they were a little bit lower. So every, you know, two minutes we, we would stop and we'd slow down and idle, let those baits drop again, speed up. And we're just running this circle, playing those baits at different depths. And you'll find that fish will hit at a specific depth and a specific distance from that piece of structure. So a lot of people seem to think that trolling is just running random stretches of beaches. There's a lot more to it than just that. Like Justin said, even running areas that don't have a specific piece of structure on them, be it a wreck, reef, rebel, whatnot, there is still a science to how you can target that area, running that zigzag pattern at a certain depth 
uh, because of a number of different factors. It could be temperature, it could be where bait's running, but you need to find a way to analyze that trend and you need to have you know, those maps uh, like Justin showed on the Navionics. Uh, you can go to Smart Fishing Tides. We have a similar map on that that's linked to Navionics, I believe, uh, or using these artificial reefs and kind of taking note of how far away you are. So there's a science uh, to this for sure in terms of spot selection and things like that. But I want to say we've now covered a full game plan for somebody to go out and start targeting kings or tarpon, cobia. There's a lot of different species that they yeah, can go after. What, okay, you got the what you need gear-wise to go out there and do it. Your rod, your reel, your line, your your hook rig, leader rig. You've got um, the types of things you're going to look for structure-wise, and uh, you put all that together and pick a good weather day. And I mean, man, the, the first time you guys go out and hook a 15 pound, you, it may not seem that big, but a 15 pound kingfish, you're going to wonder like, man, why did I do this sooner? <laughs> it is so much fun, guys. And it's a small window to go out and do it. The kingfish are available year round, but in terms of when they come in shallow to feed on these, these schools of bait fish right off the beaches, it's a magical time of the year. Um, you know, we, we've had a couple podcasts here in the, in the past with uh, Captain Tyler Capella talking about uh, tarpon fishing, okay? And tarpon fishing is its own deal. But tarpon kind of roll into this category too. But kingfish, the occasional cobia, triple tail. Um, you know, one thing we really didn't want, we didn't talk about here, but it's probably worth mentioning, the nearshore conversation about bottom fishing as well. So just kind of a quick overview on bottom fishing. You can bottom fish with the same spinning setup or conventional setup uh, that we've talked about specifically for kingfish. The downside is that those light tipped rods that we talked about before, you're gonna sacrifice a little bit of power that you might otherwise need bottom fishing if you're gonna put a live bait or a dead bait on bottom. But these patchy uh, pieces of rubble, these artificial reefs or this natural reef line, especially guys along the panhandle, Alabama, Louisiana, you have these artificial reefs and natural reef structures we're in red snapper season right now, guys. And red snapper are an awesome fish to go out and get. There's sometimes, they sometimes even come into the bridges and in the bays up in the panhandle in Navar, which is crazy. But uh, the biggest thing I think there, uh, definitely go with a nylon leader, like a monofilament or fluorocarbon leader. Um, when you're going for snapper and grouper, sometimes they can be a little line shy. Um, 50 to 60 pound can certainly work. But if you find out you aren't getting bites when you're over a piece of structure and you're bottom fishing, drop down that leader size, down from 50 to 40, sometimes even down to 30 pounds. Might be a little dicey. You might get a cut off here and there, but you'll get that bite. And that's really, then it's going to be on you to, you know, finesse and tap dance and get that fish up. Um, so I think that the most, for me, when I'm bottom fishing, I still think the conventional reigns supreme. Um, that 30 to 40 pound braid is still the right pound braid that you'll need to go out there and do those things. You can do a line to line connection or you can tie to a swivel and do either what's called a knocker rig where that sinker is going to go right up against the hook. Or you can do a fish finder rig where the sinker rests on the backside of the swivel and then you have your leader and your hook. Um, those are the two basic rigs for bottom fishing. And uh, I, I like the conventional setup because all of your power is coming from a conventional setup. The line is rolling straight from the conventional out through the guides and down. So you're not having to sacrifice power of, you know, being on the turn of the handle and winching a fish up. On a spinning setup, the line's coming off at a 90 degree angle on that line roller and you are giving a little bit of that torque that you're gonna have on a conventional setup. So that's why guys talk about just point the rod down and just start cranking when you get a grouper and a snapper on because that conventional setup is really picking up that line much more efficiently. Um, so those senators, like we talked about, you know, before, um, a little Shimano Torium, a little Daiwa Seagate, a little pen warfare for under hundred bucks, load that with 30, 40 pound braid and a 50, 60 pound liter, drop a fresh, you know, sardine down on bottom with whatever weight size you need to get down to the depth that you're in. And as soon as you hook up, just start winching that puppy in. So, that option's available to you, but those fish are so structure oriented that you really need to hone in on these pieces of structure that, that, uh, that Wyatt pointed out. Um, there's a lot of resources that'll show you those artificial reefs or that natural reef line to go fish. But in the case of Brevard County, myself, and you know the Northeast part of Florida and some parts of the Carolinas, within a couple miles of land, there might not be as many of those, those natural relief structures. 
So that type of bottom fishing might not be as accessible to you. So we're just, that's why we talk about kingfish and other migratory fish because they cover a large area. And once you find those highways and those zones, you have miles and miles and miles that you can fish and fish successfully to get to put fish in the boat. So I think I just, just wanted to add that tail in there to give some respect to uh, the very, uh, very aggressive bottom fish out there. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it's nice because it provides a lot of options. You know, if you know, maybe the kingfish bite's not on and you're trolling around a rig, it's like, hey, let's go drop some diamond jigs and see if we can pull up some snappers or some grouper. So it's, it's really cool how much is available. Um, it, it's a lot of different dimensions, just like inshore fishing. There's a lot of things that you can do. Um, before we wrap this up, I want to try and get, you know, another one more little nugget from you uh, in terms of just things that you've learned that you wouldn't know if you hadn't gone out on the water. One thing I'm going to go ahead and share is, you know, the first time I went out for Kings here in Texas, I didn't bring a gaff with me, totally forgot to do it. And, uh, and you know, knowing uh, you, it's just not something you're going to think about if this is your first time going out, you know, maybe no one's ever even told you what a gaff even is. It's basically just a giant hook that's attached to a handle. It helps and assists you in landing these fish. Now, it's for your safety, number one, because these are very strong, powerful fish. You get a big enough king, uh, it starts slapping its tail around. It, it's really tough to get them in the boat, and you don't want to grab that you know, that wire leader that's got stinger hooks on it and have that fish shake around, you end up with, you know, treble hooks in your hand. It's, it's tough to just pull them in the boat without breaking them off or hurting yourself. So that's where you gap them with that hook, as you guys will see in some of these videos that we're going to have up here soon. But another big portion of it is when you hook into one of those kings and it starts putting those bad vibes off in the water, you're going to attract some sharks and they're going to come up and it's, you don't want to be putting your hand in the water to tail grab those kings. Uh, when there's sharks swimming under the boat. And I've, I've had some videos where, uh, you know, that first day we went out without the gaff, there was sharks and trying to tail grab those, uh, those kings around those sharks, not very safe. And uh, they, uh, they'll definitely get you if you're not careful. So big thing, bring a gaff. It's uh, the easiest way to land kingfish. There's some fish that are, you know, near shore that you don't want to gaff. I, this is just specifically for kings that I'm talking about. Uh, obviously, you're not going to gaff a tarpon or, a, you know, a, a sail, but uh, it, just make sure that if you're going after kings, which is, you know, the main subject we've, we've gone over in this, uh, this tea time, make sure that you have a gaff. It's going to help out a whole lot. And the, the spot you're going to want to aim for when you gaff, right behind those gills. You don't want to ruin any of that meat on their back. Uh, and it's just a, a nice, easy target for you to try and hit when you've got them alongside the boat and they're tired. But uh, Justin, do you have any, uh, any of those, those, those hard learned tips that you might be able to share there with all your experience going offshore? I 100% agree with the gaff for the safety of, of you, the angler. Um, I used to have a cage spear. I still do. A cage spear is like, like a long dowel with basically just a sharp rod on the end. Not as effective when using on kingfish because the area to hit, they're, they're big, long hot dogs, you know. But um, I've had my rough times not having a gaff when I, when I really needed it. The biggest thing I, I'd say... Just a little tidbit. I was taught this when I was in college and I went fishing with uh, uh, Paul Saberak. He runs a chartered business down in Jupiter. He's a big sailfish tournament guy. And we had goggle eyes on the boat. I'd never fished with a goggle eye before. I've used shrimp and mullet and pinfish and stuff and, and a little five gallon bucket with an aerator. And he, like, you know, was very serious about a lot of things as we were pre fishing for a sailfish tournament. And he looked at me dead in the eyes. He goes, Every single bait that you have, this is a bait, not a phone. Every single bait that you have, treat it like it's a 24 karat brick of gold, okay? Every bait that you have, keep as lively as possible. Don't handle it any longer than you need to because these pelagic migratory bait fish, they don't end up in areas that are around people, okay? Like mullet and pinfish and stuff are always around people. It could be underneath docks. We could catch them and let them go. I don't know. They're, I don't want to say they're more domesticated. They're just... These pelagic fish, put, they, they cover a lot of water. They burn a lot of energy. And the last thing you want to do is stress out that bait fish, especially if it's a goggle eye and it's $100 a dozen uh, or whatever bait fish you buy or catch. Treat them with the utmost care because the livelier your bait fish is, the better chances you are to get a strike. If you put out a dumb squirrely bait, it might get hit. It might get hit by a shark or a barracuda or something you might not want to deal with. But these kingfish are looking for the liveliest, most natural bait fish in these schools. They'll zip in, get a bait fish from the school, cut off the tail, come back and get the remains of the head and keep on with their way. 
So you want a really feisty lively bait fish when you're when you're near shore fishing. Uh, so I try to make sure that I've got a lot of water, a lot of water in my live well or in my bait bucket or whatever I'm going to use. Um, and I don't have too many baits to stress them out. When I handle them, I try not to drop them on the ground. I try not to hold them for too long out of the water. I just try to be really quick and careful with all my live baits. So that's my tip that I want to leave you guys with. That's a that's a very good one, especially when those gogglers are costing you a hundred dollars a dozen. I would be treating it like it was a twenty four karat uh, you know piece of jewelry. So that's a very good little nugget of knowledge there, Justin. Guys. I think we've covered just about everything there is to cover in terms of a one-on-one course. And obviously we're gonna be putting a lot more out on the site. We're gonna have some videos up soon for rigging, tactics, things like that. So there's more information coming. And that's why we recommend you guys join us in the Salt Strong Insider Club, because there's a lot of stuff that we didn't cover in this video that we're gonna have there up soon. And you can talk with us in the community, ask questions to us, and you'll see reports up live daily. And we'll be putting up insider reports. So I have put my insider report up for Kingfish. Justin's likely going to have some up soon as well. So we're going to have a lot of great information in the insider community. We're hoping you guys will join us there. And on top of all the great info you're going to get, you're going to get 20% off of our Salt Strong shop. Lots of great items, items in there. I believe there's some tackle in there that you could use to set up some of those stinger eggs and things like that. So definitely recommend you guys join us for not only the info, but the discount as well and it'd be great to have you guys in the community to talk with you and be able to answer your questions so guys thank you again so much for watching and we're looking forward to seeing you on the next tea time so if you're new to salt strong just know that we're the best online fishing club in america because we literally guarantee that you'll be catching more fish in less time while saving money on your tackle we do this by providing you with premium education an exclusive online fishing community and access to group discounts on the best saltwater fishing tackle to learn more go to saltstrong.com we hope to see you in the insider club family soon